What's up guys, JP back at you once again, bringing you guys MMA Cast episode 5 on the docket. Today we have UFC 200, we have UFC Fight Night, Eddie Alvarez versus Rafael Dos Anjos, and of course we have tonight's event, UFC Fight Night, Ultimate Fighter Finale, Yin Jae Chek versus Claudia Gedalia. Uh, plus we have the breaking news of John Jones being removed from UFC 200. So this episode is a few days late and in being a few days late, it kind of gives us room to talk about this John Jones thing because had I recorded this on Monday, like I'm supposed to, this would have happened afterwards. First of all, guys, I gotta say, when Jones Cormier was announced as the main event of UFC 200, I wasn't super stoked. I was pretty stoked, but not super stoked, because the first fight was so dominant by John Jones, minus the first round, that I didn't really think that Daniel Cormier had enough in him uh, to make it a competitive win for him. So, you know, sometimes when you have these matches that are you know, very predictable in the outcome, you don't get as excited for. But then a few little X factors happen with the way John Jones looked against OSP. He looked a little rusty. Uh, He looked a little off and slow. And uh, Daniel Cormier continued to be dominant. Um, Well, not so much dominant in the case of Alexander Gustafson. That was a very competitive fight, but it was also a very competitive fight for uh, John Jones. So there's that, and then the long layoff, and then uh, the fact that Daniel Cormier is the champion, and Jones has to, you know, prove himself again to reclaim that title. There was a lot of different narratives going into that fight that made me more excited, and the more the hype came through, the more the embedded's came out, the more the press conferences and uh, specials on UFC. Uh, it's time and, and things, the more those came out, the more excited I got. And then when they announced Brock Lesnar to the fight card, it was a perfect little balance of uh, of fights. The main card was stacked, the prelims were stacked, and it was laid out in a way that I thought was truly great. Uh, you had the opening fight that was probably a number one contender fight, probably still is a number one contender fight, and Travis Brown and Cain Velasquez. Like, when Cain Velasquez versus Travis Brown opens up your card, you got a lot of stuff on your card, your main card. Uh, and then you had the Frankie Edgar, Jose Auto title fight, and then to the women's division, and then you have a nice little break from title fights, and you have this three-rounder that's super intriguing in Mark Hunt and uh, Brock Lesnar, And then you have the main event, which is, you know, two of the best fighters in the world unifying a title. After a long layoff and after John Jones' story and the hit and run and the cocaine and all of this stuff that made it sort of special. And it it really did feel like the perfect UFC 200 card uh, in the way that it laid out without Conor McGregor, without Nate Diaz, without Ronda Rousey. It became much better than I anticipated when Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz was initially removed from the card. And I was very happy with it. I was super stoked. I For UFC 200, I was like, this is good enough. This is, this is what I wanted out of UFC 200. And as the days went on, I was waiting for those injuries. I was waiting for these last-minute replacements. And then... I thought we were out of that. I thought we were out of the woods, guys. I truly did. I remember thinking about it yesterday, early in the day, and I was like, this is really going to happen. Not only is uh, Yenjechek Gedelia going to happen, but Alvarez Dos Anjos is going to happen, and the entire UFC 200 card. And I started to get really happy because that was one of my worries going into this. So last night, my friend texted me as I was watching the last episode of The Ultimate Fighter because I missed it on Wednesday. I was watching it on DVR. My friend texted me an article that said Jones has been pulled from UFC 200. And my stomach, I swear to God, guys, it instantly felt like I was gutted. It, It hurt. My stomach literally dropped. And I was like, this, please be a joke. Please be a joke. Please be one of those fake news articles that that come out every once in a while. And I clicked it. It was from Incredible Source, Bloody Elbow. And I knew that it was true right then. And I just was like, no, 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 no. And then I read, apparently John Jones, 
his sample that was took in June by USADA was flagged for a potential violation. Now, they do not say if it was a recreational drug like cocaine or marijuana or a performance-enhancing drug like steroids or something that's not performance-enhancing but could be used to mask performance-enhancing. You know, the list is endless of banned substances, some substances under uh, the USADA rules and regulations and guidelines and, and banned substances. So it could be that, but they haven't said what it is, which is very typical of, of this when it happens. You just know about the violation. Uh, Jones did hold a press conference, and he said he strongly stood on the fact that he's always been against performance-enhancing drugs, and he does not take performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, it seems to be that they're leaning more along the lines of some sort of um, banned substance supplement uh that was maybe unknown to them and once again this this happens quite frequent frequently in these cases where uh the list is so extensive of banned substances that stuff that you might not even think is banned is banned all for whatever reason and a lot of fighters have not cross-referenced these lists which I understand it's a it's a giant list and there's so many things there's multiple pages of just a letter a sub substances you know and but that's that's they these guys are professional athletes in John Jones's case a millionaire uh, it's the same reason why he should should have been taking the Uber and you know hired somebody to drive in places. Um, there's somebody that should have been checking all this stuff if it is, in fact, something um, that they missed in a supplement. And it's it's terrible, guys. It really is. Where does John G Jones go from here? He has a potential two-year suspension in his horizon. He did file an appeal to have the B test sample tested, and that is currently being tested right now. And apparently, uh, the results should be out tonight. Uh, if the B test comes back negative, I believe um, his sentence would be reduced. However, if it comes back positive, he is facing up to two years uh, suspension, which is just is just very bad for John Jones's career, which is really kind of haven't even got on its firm standing as of right now. Uh, you know, who knows where John Jones goes from here if that test is in fact positive i do believe he would still fight after two years but this is a guy who many people have thought would be dominant all throughout his prime which you know even before he hit his prime he was dominant and we, we were looking at him like he was going to be the greatest champion greatest fighter in ufc history and his career has really took a bad turn and his legacy has took a bad turn uh, in terms of um, what's what his future entails. It's it's very sad uh, that you have somebody so talented that, that cannot seem to do everything by the book. It's sad for Daniel Cormier, who was looking at a mega payday in this fight, UFC main event. Uh, and he wanted to prove that he was the real champion. Um, I think that it is no longer fair to criticize DC for not being the real champion. Um, because he was showing up to this fight to fight John Jones. And we wouldn't have known what was going to happen. So if John Jones is going to be suspended, DC, Daniel Cormier, is the heavy, uh, the light heavyweight UFC champion. I'm no longer going to be like, well, he's not really the champion. Uh, he is the champion. Uh, and I will say that I am hoping and praying that somebody steps in and fights Daniel Cormier and he gets to remain on the car card. Not only for Daniel Cormier to, to make that payday, to fight at this historic event, uh, to not waste his training camp and his time. D DC's not very young. Uh, you know, he's he's in his, I think, almost mid-30s. He doesn't have the most time in the sport. And it would be wrong for him to miss this momentous occasion. And 
I hope that somebody steps in. I read that Michael Bisping threw his ring in the hat. That would be something amazing, I think. I think that's the fight you make. Uh, do you, are you really losing much with Michael Bisbee, Bisbing losing his fight? A lot of people don't think that he'll remain the middleweight champion very long. So, I mean, if people are thinking he's going to lose in his first title defense anyway, why not take that gamble and let him fight for the light heavyweight title. He's fought at light heavyweight before. He wouldn't have to cut much weight, if any at all. Uh, let him do it. I think that would be amazing. It would be so crazy for that to happen. And honestly, it would rival the fight that already existed on that card. Um, the other person that people were kind of talking about is Gegard Mousasi, who is fighting on the UFC 200 card. That would suck for his opponent having to withdraw from that bout, but I believe his opponent was short notice. I can't even remember who his opponent is right now, but I believe he was short notice replacement for somebody else anyway. And uh, I, I'm less interested in Gegard Mousasi versus Daniel Cormier. I really am. I've, I, I like Gegard Mousasi, but... Um, I don't like him enough for him to be the champion. Um, I think it would be bad if DC lost to Gegard Mousasi, which is possible. And the Michael Bisbing fight, if Michael Bisbing wins, you have the first ever uh, multi-title holder at the same time in two different weight classes. The feat that Conor McGregor tried, the feat that BJ Ben tried... For Michael Bisping to like come out of nowhere, win the middleweight title, and then win the light heavyweight title is just a story that you couldn't pass up, even if it is very, very slim. And Daniel Cormier winning against Bisping, well, yeah, he's the bigger athlete, he's the better wrestler, like he should win that fight. Um, but Bisping has looked great on short notice. Make the Bisping fight happen. It's UFC 200, damn it. It would be amazing. Uh, anybody else? Uh, anybody. Just put anybody in there at the end of the day. Uh, me as a fan, I, I liked all these title fights on the card. Uh, because if they remove Daniel Cormier, then that's one less title fight. Uh, Brock Lesnar, Mark Hunt moved to the main event, but that's a three-round fight. So, I mean, it, it's it's a significantly less uh, you know main card, which I, I was... Ha- planning on doing like a party thing so like i wanted it to last really long i took a vacation from work for this weekend i I just really wanted this to be this big epic thing that that only comes once in a lifetime really um maybe twice three times whatever uh in terms of the magnitude of it but you know this this card is was amazing and and i really wanted it to be a memorable night for me uh being an mma fan I really, really am bummed out over this, but <clears throat> even with that, even with the removal of John Jones, if Daniel Cormier could get an opponent, I will not be bummed out. However, if he doesn't, I- I'm going to be a little bummed, guys. I'm going to be a little salty going into UFC 200, which is sad, I know, but it's it's the, it's the truth. Uh, Dana White seems like he wants to get find DC an opponent, uh, you know, DC wants an opponent. People want to be DC's opponent. So I, I look for him to get it done. I'm just hoping and praying they can get it done in time. Uh, it's only a couple days away. But yeah, guys, uh, super bummed out about that. But let's go ahead. And uh, right now, I was going to answer a little fan question. Uh, by fan, I don't mean fan of me. I mean fan of MMA. Uh, Marco uh, Vir. Tannen. <laughs> uh, Marco is a longtime listener of mine, uh, both podcast wise, video wise, uh, and I, I, I was un, uh, I actually didn't know he was a big MMA fan as well. <clears throat> but you know, he he sent in a little quish question via Twitter, so I figured I would uh, go ahead and answer that now. Uh, he said, "Would love to hear what is your all time favorite MMA fight for me." It would be Sanchez versus Guido on Tough Final 2009. <clears throat> so, uh, Marco uh, is a really, really, you know, awesome dude. Like, he always has commented on my videos, commented on my podcast and stuff. So, thank you for sending in that question, Marco. And uh, I, I look for many more. So, my favorite fight of all time is is a very hard question to answer because there's there's two different ways I can answer it because... There is one fight that got me into MMA pretty 
pretty significant in, in getting me into MMA, and that is the Forrest Griffin Stefan Bonner fight. Um, just because that was the first time that I was really exposed to it at the uh, Tough One finale, finale. And it, you know, I guess I was exposed to it a little bit before. I remember my first fight ever was when Chuck Liddell fought Babalu, uh, Sabral. But this one was the first one that kind of, uh, I had, it had meaning behind it to me because of the journey through the Ultimate Fighter Season 1. Uh, but that is not my favorite fight anymore. That fight was replaced in September of 2013, September 21st to be exact. And it was UFC 165, John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson. That fight is my favorite fight for many reasons. One, I remember the build up to the fight. Everybody was saying, oh, look how they're marketing Gustafson. John Jones is going to eat him alive. They literally have nothing to bank on, so they're, they're talking about his size and his reach, his height. It, and people were just angry and bitter about it. <clears throat> and then going into the fight, nobody gave Gustafson a, a chance. And John Jones was this world beater. He was this guy who was not going to lose to anybody ever. And he went in and it was a dog fight. Uh, I remember seeing Gustafson get it, get a takedown. And, you know, he just looked way better than you ever expected. And I remember just being on edge. The momentum shifts in that fight. The tension was so thin. It was just amazing. I remember being on the, literally the edge of my seat, like with my arms, like holding me up in the air, like every two seconds, because I couldn't take the drama. And that was the first time I realized like how much I love this sport was when I saw Jones take on Gustafson. And it was amazing. It truly was. Uh, I scored the fight for Gustafson that night. I have since went back and I believe I've scored the fight for Jones on upon rewatch. I've watched that fight three or four times for sure. And wow, it, it's it's such a great fight. It really is like the best uh, title fight in UFC history, in my opinion, um, in terms of the magnitude of the situation. I mean, Robbie Lawler has been in some great title fights too, which, I mean, Robbie Lawler versus Rory McDonald is also one of my favorite fights. Uh, it's just the, the technical uh, the things that were happening in that fight the heart of both fighters that that was displayed that night uh the drive from both fighters the will to win um everything you can say everything that makes a fight good happened in that fight uh the only way that fight could be better is if alexander gustafson was respected more going in and he was um and it was like these two mega fighters clashing like a manny pacquiao uh, Floyd Mayweather thing, you know, if, if both fighters were considered these these elite athletes, that's the only way that that fight could have been better, and uh, it, you know, oh man, I love that fight, I really do, <clears throat> and uh, Marco also asked me about uh, what, what my thoughts were on UFC middleweight champion Michael Biz Bisbing verbally agreeing to fight Dan Henderson. Um, so my thoughts on this are very simple. One, yeah, it, it does not make sense. It's, it's cutting the line. It's, it's not sporting. It's, it's spectacle prize fighting at its finest. Uh, it is not number one versus number two. It is not number one versus number three. Uh, it's not the way you do title fights. Uh, it's the person, Dan Henderson, not, did not earn his title shot. However, <clears throat> as long as we acknowledge the fact that it is bad sporting, I'm fine with it actually happening. And, the, and this is the reason why. If this happened every time, it would be a mess and it would be terrible for the sport. But here and there, guys, it's not really a big deal. It's one title shot. Then you move back on and you and you have the you go through the contenders. You don't get to make a fight like this very often. A fight that is kind of been you know, you know it's it's a fight that 
has went down in history as as a crazy knockout. It's it's probably the best knockout ever in UFC history. It happened at UFC 100. It's a historical moment in both men's career. And Michael Bisping has went on to become the champion. Dan Henderson won his last fight. And let's be honest, guys. Do you really think that Dan Henderson cannot beat Michael Bisping if he fought for the title? So what does that say? Does that say he's undeserving completely? I think it doesn't because he literally can beat that guy. He hasn't earned his way there. But he's going to retire soon. It's it's something that sometimes in life and in sports you need to just look, look around, set aside everything that we know how it works and just do something a little crazy every once in a while you have to do that it it keeps the sport from being predictable and i am strongly against this happening all the time 100 percent. i would not want to see it's the same situation when john jones fought chael sonnen simply because chael sonnen raised his hand and nobody else did you know and it's really murky they really forced that fight into it chow sun was coming off a loss blah blah, blah. but it, it was a big fight it really was and it, it added to some good drama on the ultimate fighter and it makes sense to do this every once in a while when the when the setting is right and the landscape is right uh this, i think that it would be fine to make this fight i do not want to see this happen all the time but i'm so intrigued by the fight and it's almost like you you know that you would never have a chance to do it again in this way. So what like th- there's multiple ways I look at it. One, Bisbing if he wins like he should, he would get a title defense. And Bisbing I feel is trying to retire soon. Um but I think he really wants a title defense. And if Dan Henderson wins, then you have this incredible story of this 45-year-old guy win the UFC middleweight title I mean he would be this story would be amazing it would be it would be a really cool story and uh you know it, it's just an interesting story that I I wouldn't mind seeing happen and with that said you know I I I understand why people wouldn't want to see it happen but it's not like this is happening all the time for the most part UFC does match the fights appropriately they they really do uh and i don't know i i understand it is what i'm saying but i i wouldn't mind seeing it seriously uh so with that said guys we're gonna get into uh the ufc cards we have july 7th 8th and 9th uh i actually i thought the uh ultimate fighter finale was tonight but it's actually tomorrow night the uh dos sanjos fight pass card is on tonight so uh, we'll we'll get into that one a little bit. Uh, it is taking place in Las Vegas, Nevada, July seventh. Uh, that is tonight. Uh, I'm looking at the card right now. There's a lot of fighters that I don't know in the prelims, so I'm not really going to get into those. Um, in this one, let's go with let's start at the second to last fight. Uh, we have John McDessie taking on Mahade Baghdad. Um, I actually don't remember Baghdad that much, but I know John McDessie, and uh, I, I like John McDessie. Um, not doing super well as of late. Lost to Donald Cerrone, uh, Yancy Medeiros. Uh, I I would assume he gets the win here. After that, we have Mike Powell versus Alberto Mina. Um, Mike Powell looked so awesome in his last fight. He was rocked. He came back. Uh, just just such a good fight. Uh, Mike Powell is is the shit i love that guy he's so fun to watch and he's getting old as hell too he's he's 40 now um he's taking on alberto mina mino uh who's under mina who is undefeated um guys i seriously do not see how mike powell wins this fight i i doubt him all the time i don't think i ever pick his fights right um but i'm gonna go with alberto mina on that one and then after that we have uh joseph ducky duffy taking on mitch clark um, Joseph Duffy, of course, is known for giving uh, Conor McGregor his last loss before Nate Diaz. And um, Mitch Clark uh, is coming off a loss to Michael Chiesa, who's who's a really talented fighter. 
Uh, I think that I think that it would make sense for Joe Duffy to get this one. Um, he is coming off that loss against Dustin Poirier, but has looked good. Besides that, looked good in that fight too. Um, Poirier is, I think, one of my favorite fighters out there right now. So uh, no no shame in losing to Dustin Poirier. He's definitely a hell of a fighter. Uh, and then we have Alan Joban taking on Bilal Muhammad. I believe this is a late notice fight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Alan Joban on this one. Let's go TKO round one. Now we get to the uh, the uh, co-main event here. Uh, Roy Nelson taking on Derek Lewis. Um, this is an interesting fight to me because <clears throat> I could easily see it going uh, both ways. Derek Lewis is a heavy-handed fighter. If this was four years ago, I would 100% pick Roy Nelson. 100%. Uh, but Roy Nelson has not looked great as of late. He lost, uh, going back to his KO against Czech Congo, he lost to Stipe Miocic. He lost to Daniel Cormier. Uh, he did beat Big Nog, which is under you know understandable. Uh, he lost to Mark Hunt via KO. Uh, he lost to Alistair Overeem. Out over him really picked him apart. Uh, he lost to Josh Barnett, and same thing uh, with Josh Barnett. And he won against Jared Rochelle, which I do not even remember that fight, but I'm sure it was terrible. Uh, Derek Lewis, on the other hand, his last lo- loss was to uh, Sean Jordan, but then he has three K- KOs in a row against Gabriel Gonzaga, Grabowski, and Victor Pesta. Um, I would pick Roy Nelson. If this was a while ago, but like I said, Roy Nelson does not look the same. He's he's got KO'd since then. He was known for having this chin of steel. Uh, granted, Mark Hunt is a heavy puncher, but I think Derek Lewis has just as heavy punches or is close to it. And Roy Nelson does have gra- the ground advantage for sure, but will he take the fight down? I don't think so. Um, I either see this fight going... Uh, in the form of Derek Lewis, where he gets he hits Roy Nelson with like a sneaky uppercut or something, or it looks like the Matt Mitch Rion fight in which Derek Lewis got KO'd pretty quickly, like against the fence or something by Roy Nelson. Um, I think I think he has to play distance uh, because Roy Nelson is going to want to definitely get on the inside and maybe do some dirty boxing um, and. I, I think I'm going to pick Derek Lewis in this fight, though. I really am. The Black Beast Derek Lewis. <clears throat> Good fight, by the way. All right, then we have uh, Lightweight, the main event. Lightweight's Rafael Dos Anjos taking on Eddie Alvarez. I got to say, I'm actually really looking forward to this fight. I've, all, I've been a fan of Eddie Alvarez for a while, um, Bell, since Bellator, actually. I... Uh, I remember his Michael Chandler fights being so good. I love those fights. Uh, he came into the UFC, lost a decision to Donald Cerrone that was actually really close. Um, then he won a decision, split against Gilbert Melendez, and split against Anthony Pettis. Uh, both fights that I did score for Eddie Alvarez. <clears throat> and um, he's taking on Rafael Dos Anjos, who is kind of a weird case because he really did just come out of sort of nowhere in terms of like his contention I guess Um, he was in the UFC for such a long time Uh, I remember his UFC debut that Jeremy Stevens brutal knockout um, that uppercut I I actually remember ordering uh, that pay-per-view it was one of the rare pay-per-views that I ordered back in 2008 and uh yeah, he he fought, um, you know, Jeremy Stevens lost, had win, a lot of wins, then some losses, uh, and then he went on a nice little win streak before he ran into Namaga Madoff, and then he went on another win streak and won the title against Anthony Pettis. He defended one time against Donald Cerrone. For some reason, I honestly do feel like Donnie, Donald Cerrone is the better fighter. I really do. It's just the way that it's, I don't know. It's the way that it happens with Donald Cerrone, like these title fights and and these big fights. I don't like Dos Anchos really at all. He's probably, he's probably honestly my least favorite champion. 
Um, and it's been a while since we've had like a, a dominant champion at lightweight who has been very exciting to me. Um, it was since Frankie Edgar. Um, I didn't like Benson Henderson as a title holder, uh, and I I did like Anthony Pettis, but it only lasted one fight. And so now we have uh, Dos Anjos again. <clears throat> I don't know, guys. Like, he's obviously a good wrestler, as is Eddie Alvarez. Um, he pushes the pace well. He did that great against Donald Cerrone and Anthony Pettis. But Eddie Alvarez is way different than both of those fighters. Like, I, I really think that Eddie Alvarez is going to fight smart. He's going to stay on the outside. He's going to utilize his jab. He's going to catch uh, Rafael Dos Sanchez coming in. Um, he's going to be quicker. He's going to be uh, more fluid in his movement, his lateral movement. I think I honestly, I honestly don't think Dos Anjos is going to win this fight, and I, I'm really hoping for that. Like, it would be super awesome to see a guy in Eddie Alvarez who, who honestly, like people, <clears throat> people thought after losing to Cerrone that like his fight against Melendez was like do or die, and two fights later he's fighting for the title. Um, I. I would rather see an Eddie Alvarez cha be champion than Dos Anjos. The lightweight title has never stayed in one place for long. I believe the most defenses ever is three. Uh, I believe Benson Henderson had three and BJ Penn had three. And I gotta say, like, uh, I, I really do want to see Eddie Alvarez win this fight. And I, I do think he'll win, but I, it's going to be probably one of those, like, super close fights where it's like a split decision because Eddie Alvarez is pretty pretty known for, for doing that um so yeah uh, I think the most defenses ever um is three I think Benson Henderson Frankie Edgar and well no no because that one fight would be with Frank, Frankie and Gray Maynard was a draw uh yeah so three um BJ Penn defended the title against Sean Shirt, Kenny Florian and Diego Sanchez and then Benson Henderson uh, defeated um, Frankie Edgar, uh, Nate Diaz, and Gilbert Melendez. And then Pettis. Oh, Pettis did have one defense, Gilbert Melendez. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very it's very unlikely to see it. See, I, I think it's very unlikely that Dosanjos is the guy to defend more than three times. Now this is only his second title defense, so he probably defend it, it this one and maybe lose on the third one i don't know lose on the fourth one i don't know um crazy to think that it's only been defended three times at most but uh i'm gonna go with eddie alvarez on this fight i like eddie alvarez i want to see him win and i think that he is the better fighter i honestly do i've never been sold on dos anjos uh, after that, we're going to move into July 8th. We have the Ultimate Fighter Team Joanna versus Team Claudia final. Um, this this is a pretty good card, honestly, for uh, Ultimate Fighter finale. Um, let's let's start at the. Uh, we got the prelim preliminary card fight pass. We got Li Jingling Liang taking on Anton Zafir. I uh, don't know either of those fighters. We have lightweight Jake Matthews taking on Kevin Lee. I'll go with Jake Matthews on that one. Middleweight Cesar Fiera taking on Anthony Smith. I'll go with uh, Fiera on that one. Uh, then we have light heavyweight Josh Stansberry taking on Corey Hendricks. Uh, Josh Stansberry was the runner up in the uh, Ultimate Fighter competition. I guess he fought Khalil. And he lost to Khalil in the semifinals. Then we have John Moraga at flyweight. Oh, I will go with Stansberry, by the way. Then he was he was a pretty good fighter, honestly. I was surprised to see him lose by Khalil. Uh, then we have flyweights John Moraga taking on Mathis Nicolau. Uh, I'm going with John Moraga. How long has it been since we've seen John Moraga fight? It feels like a very long time. Yeah, his last fight was May of 2015, so a little over a year where he lost to Joseph Benavides. Um, I'll go with John Moraga. Uh, featherweight, making his featherweight debut, Gray Maynard taking on Fernando Bruno. Um, I don't know who Fernando Bruno is, but I know who Gray Maynard is. I think Gray Maynard's chin is shot. I'm going to go with Fernando Bruno on there, though I'll be re rooting for Gray Maynard. 
Uh, lightweights, we have <clears throat> we have uh, Jaquim Silva taking on Andrew Holbrook. Does anybody know why the hell this is on the main card? Like, I don't even know either of those guys. Unless they were members of the Ultimate Fighter. Um, I don't know. Uh, then we have Featherweight Du Hu Choi taking on Tiago Tavares. I'll go with uh, Du Hu Choi on that one. Lightweight's Ross Pearson taking on Will Brooks. This is a very fascinating fight because it is uh, Will Brooks, the former Bellator lightweight champion. He left Bellator with the belt. His only loss is to Syed Awad. <clears throat> and he went on to beat Syed Wad later. So, um, pretty clean slate. Alexander Sharanovsky, Michael Chandler twice. Though That's a huge feather in his cap. Dave Jensen, Marcin Held. Um, those are good fighters, man. Marcin Held's a little tough submission guy. Michael Chandler's a really good fighter. Looked great in his last fight against uh, Patricky Pitbull. And he's taking on Ross Pearson, who, honestly, you know, is not the best fighter, but Ross Pearson's respected. Uh, great technical boxer. Um, you know, looking at his career, he's he's done a lot of win-loss, 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 win-loss thing, but um, he has some good wins. He has a win over Paul Felder, uh, Chad LaPriest, Sam Stout, Gray Maynard, uh, Ryan Couture, George Sotiropoulos, um Spencer Fisher. I mean, yeah, he has wins. Definitely has wins. Uh, he has some losses too, but he lost against some good guys. Um, he could win this fight, but you got to go Will Brooks on this one. Ill Will Brooks. I see no reason why he doesn't get it done. Women's strawweight, you have Amanda Cooper taking on Tatiana Soraz, Sorez. Um, uh, Tatiana is definitely probably the better fighter. I'm going to pick her in this fight. She looked great on her season in Ultimate Fighter this past season. Um, super, super well-rounded. Um, just just very dominant and aggressive. Amanda Cooper doesn't stick out as much. I will go with Tatiana on that one. Uh, and then we have late heavyweight Andrew Sanchez taking on Khalil Roundtree. Um, I'm going to go with Andrew Sanchez on this one because Khalil had already lost. And even though he looked good against Stansberry, Andrew Sanchez looked good the whole time. So I'll go with Andrew Sanchez. Then we have the main event, women's strawweight, Yanni and Jacek taking on Claudia Gedalia. Um, Their first fight, I do think I scored it for Ian Jacek, but it's very debatable. Uh, Claudia, I have grown to like over this season of The Ultimate Fighter. I really don't think that... uh, that she's going to dominate Yin Jacek or anything, but I wouldn't be surprised if she gets the job done. In fact, I'm actually going to pick Claudia Gedalia. Um, the court reasoning behind this is I do think that she as is up there in terms of technique and athleticism and skill as Yin Jacek. And I think the deciding factor here is the fact that Joanna, I feel, highly leans. Maybe not highly leans, but she definitely gets a little advantage going into fights against her opponents because she gets in their head. And I honestly do not see her in Claudia's head at all. At all. Like, not even the slightest bit. If anything, I see it the other way around a little bit. Which is is definitely weird. Um... I used to love Yin Jacek, and I still do like her a lot. She's a great fighter. She's she's funny. Uh, she has this this seriousness about her. But she came off bad on the Ultimate Fighter. She did come off like a bully, and Claudia came off like cool, calm, and composed, and just 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 a nice person. So uh, I got to go with Claudia on this one. Um, Yin Jacek does have the better scrappy boxing, um, good takedown defense. Uh, but I, I think I'm, I think I, I think I'm gonna go with Claudia on this one, honestly. So uh, then we move into UFC 200, of course, July 9th. <clears throat> Let's hope that we can still see Daniel Cormier on this card. Um, would be great, but for right now, we'll just predict it as as he's not. Um, preliminary card: We got Jim Miller taking on Takanori Gomi. Uh, this is just a fun fight for the fans. This card had such a great mixture of like, you know, serious fights, uh, meaningful fights, and fun fights. So Jim Miller, uh, obviously nowhere near a title shot. Uh, he's he's lost four out of his last five. Um, his lone win coming 
uh, against Danny Castillo, which was a split decision, but he lost to Cerrone, Benil Darius, Michael Chiesa, and D- and Diego Sanchez. Um, so uh, that actually is surprising that he lost to Diego Sanchez. I, I, I can't remember that fight greatly, but did was that one of those screwy fuckery decisions? I can't remember. Um, he's taking on Takanoi Gomi, who is... Th- wow, Takanoi Gomi is 37. That is crazy. I did not know that. While Jim Miller is 32. Uh, Takanoi Gomi, uh, looking at his record, you know, he's always been an exciting fighter, but he has not been fighting too well lately. He actually got TKO'd by Joe Lozon in, in his last fight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with Jim Miller on this one. Uh, Jim Miller is such a well-rounded fighter. Uh, got great submissions, got great striking, uh, tough as nails. Uh, I look for him to get the job done against Takanoi Gomi. Then you have Gegard Musasi taking on Tiago Santos. Um, Tiago Santos has won his last four fights, his last loss coming to Uriah Hall. Uh, he has a TKO against Andy Irons, Steve Bosse, a head kick KO, a unanimous decision against Elias Theodoro, and a KO against Nate Marquardt. And you have Gegard Musasi, on the other hand, who I believe is coming off a loss. No, he's coming off a win against Talos Leitas, and he had that crazy uh, TKO spinning thing against Uriah Hall, a flying knee thing. Uh, lost before that, but Gegard Musasi is a well-rounded fighter. Um, I'm actually going to pick Tiago Santos in this one, though. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just. I just got a feeling on this one. Uh, then we go to lightweights. Diego Sanchez taking on Joe Lozon. Uh, Diego Sanchez and Joe Lozon is a super exciting fight, guys. That I'm so surprised have not fought each other yet because they have been in the same weight class for ever i mean i think 2005 was diego sanchez's first fight in the ufc against kenny florian and joe lozon's first fight was uh in 2006 where he defeated the former champion jens palver which which is crazy right i mean these guys have been in the ufc for over a decade and they have not fought each other and both of them have fought in the lightweight division for a long time uh, Joe Lozon is one of the most exciting fighters. He has a lot of uh, of the night bonuses. Uh, he has great fights against uh, many, many people. Uh, pff, shit. I mean, look at it. I, pretty much all of his fights are great fights. Jamie Varner, Jim Miller, uh, Melvin Guillard. Uh, I mean, Michael Chiesa. Great, great fights. Um. I was really unhappy to see him lose to Evan Dunham. Like it kind of made me realize, like Joe Lozon is probably never gonna be a, a true top ten guy or top fifteen guy. He's stuck at that gate, gatekeeper status, but he's always tough and he's always scrappy. Um, Diego Sanchez uh, should be the better fighter in this fight in terms of. I don't. What happened, to Diego Sanchez? Really though, um, he never really was able to to do what everybody thought he was going to do. He was 17-0 when he got into the damn UFC. Or, uh, you know, by the time he got his first loss against Josh Koscheck. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say that Joe Lozon wins this fight. Uh, unless Diego can force it into a scrappy brawl, um, Joe Lozon should win. Should win. I'm picking Joe Lozon. Uh, and after that, we have Sage Northcutt taking on Enrique Marin. I'm going to go with Sage Northcutt. Don't know his opponent at all, but I know Sage Northcutt. TJ Dillashaw, Hafio, Asun Sal. Um, Dillashaw is definitely a really interesting fighter because of his sort of fall from uh, championshipism. Uh, he was doing fantastic, looked great, ran into Dominic Cruz, still looked great, but um, lost that fight. And I, a lot of people scored it for him. I scored it for Dominic Cruz 100%. Uh, and Javier Asuncao, he feels like he's been out forever. He has been out forever. His last fight was in October of 2014. He does have a win over TJ Dillashaw, but it was a split decision. 
Uh, I think Dillashaw has greatly improved since that first fight. Meanwhile, I have seen nothing from uh, a Sun Cell to make the case that he has gotten as good as TJ Dillashaw has. So I'm going to go with Dillashaw. What the way Johnny Hendricks taking on Calvin Gla Gastelum? I'm going to pick Gastelum on this one. I think the reign of the big rig is finally over. And I don't say that. I don't mean that in like a way where like I was waiting for it to be over. I do like Johnny Hendricks, and he, for some reason, he does attract my attention when he fights. However, I don't like him at the same time. Like, there's something about his personality where I, I feel like he is lying, or I don't know, there's something about him that I don't really love. Um, maybe it's just his attitude, I don't know, but uh, I actually thought that Stephen Wonderboy had a great opportunity and a great chance to beat Johnny Hendricks. And I feel the same way for Kelvin Gastelum. Kelvin Gastelum is a little green, like, where he makes these mistakes a lot, I've noticed. Um, and you can't really do that against Johnny Hendricks. Uh, both guys are good at wrestling. Um, Johnny Hendricks probably has the power advantage. I look for Kelvin Gastelum to be a little bit faster. Um, let's go with Kelvin Gastelum on that one for, I believe, what would be the upset. And then you have women's bantamweights. Kat Zingano taking on Juliana Pena. Uh, Juliana Pena and Kat Zingano, uh, very intriguing fight to me. Kat Zingano hasn't fought since her loss to Ronda Rousey. She was eight or she was nine and zero when she went into that fight, lost in very quick fashion, just 14 seconds into the first round. And, uh, it was very sad to see cause I, I loved Kat Zingano. Kat Zingano is awesome. I remember when I first was introduced to her at Invicta three. And then I really was first introduced into who she was in that Misha Tate fight. She has a win over the champion. This would be a great fight for her to win. Juliana Pena, I followed her through her run on the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, looked good, looked good, came out, looked good. Um, but the problem with Juliana Pena, and this is my honest opinion, um, she has like extremely bad fight IQ um she makes crazy mistakes and does stupid things all the time that can be fixed like she can get better at controlling that stuff but um against somebody like Kat Zingano uh I don't think that she's going to be able to do what she needs to do to get the get, to get the win however Kat Zingano is 34 years old coming off a loss uh, she's a mother, I believe. She's the first mo mother to ever fight inside the octagon. Um, there's a lot of interesting sort of um, narrative surrounding her, whether she'll be able to rebound. Uh, she hasn't fought since February of 2015. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see if she'll be able to look the same as she did beforehand. I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to pick Kat Zingano. Um, but Juliana Pena is tough. She's, she's scrappy. She's fast. She always chooses a weird wardrobe. Honestly, she kind of looks funny. Um, and her fight IQ is pretty, pretty horrendous, honestly. But, uh, if she puts it together, she should be able to win. But I'm going to go with Kat Zingano because I don't think she will put it together. Then we go to the main card. We have heavyweight Kane Velasquez taking on Travis Brown. Um, this is sea level Kane, so Kane should get it done using his wrestling, his, um, just non-stop movement, uh, non-stop hustle, pressure, but I'm going to go with Travis Brown here because I think the, I don't know, I just don't have faith in Kane like I used to ever since he lost to Verdum. I always have kind of thought Verdum was a little overrated and I actually did pick Miocic to beat Verdum. So, I even thought I thought it was lame that Kane lost to him, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Travis Brown, honestly, is a really good fighter. I don't like his personality. I don't like him as a person fighter guy. But he only lost to Arlovsky and Verdum in the in his last recent fights. Um, and the Arlovsky fight could have easily went his way had like one punch been slightly different, because uh, it was crazy wild brawl and uh i give uh i definitely i definitely give travis brown a good shot to beat kane velasquez here uh i just feel like he might be a little more rangy and be able to keep kane away from him uh so we'll see if that happens 
Then we go to featherweight Jose Aldo taking on Frankie, the answer Edgar. Um, <clears throat> Jose Aldo uh, was looked at like this unstoppable, unbeatable guy for a long time. I mean, dude, he has just looking at his WEC into the UFC win streak. It's insane. It really is. He's a guy that should have been a huge star during his reign, but he just wasn't. And uh, he, Conor McGregor kind of made him a, a bit of a star. But this, you know, this fight where he got knocked out by Conor McGregor, he I honestly do believe that he should have took more time off. I seriously would not be surprised if Frankie Edgar knocks out Jose Aldo. Um, Frankie Edgar has looked so sharp as le- of as of late. He hasn't took much damage for being what thirty six years old, thirty four years old. Frankie Edgar is still in the prime of his career. Uh, he's gotten better since the time he was lightweight champion. I really think this is Edgar's time to shine. I'm picking Edgar. Edgar's one of my favorite fighters. Jose Aldo. I would not be surprised if he looks chinny all of a sudden. I thought Edgar had a good chance of winning their first fight. And he made it very competitive in the last two rounds. If he can just start a little bit sooner in this fight, it, Frankie Edgar will be uh, UFC featherweight champion. I, I I really really hope that is the case. Then we go into we have uh, women's bantamweight champion Misha Tate taking on Amanda Nunez. Uh, I'm gonna go with Misha Tate on this one. Amanda Nunez is tough, and it's and she is vicious. Uh, and typically, Misha Tate is a slow starter, which is not good because Amanda Nunez seems like a fast starter. So look for Misha Tate to weather an early blitz from Amanda Nunez. Amanda Nunez tire out a bit, and then Misha Tate get a submission, let's say, round three. Then we have Brock Lesnar and Mark Hunt. Brock Lesnar has not fought since, I believe, 2009, where he fought Alistair Overeem. I do remember that fight quite well. I've watched it a couple times, actually, since then. The former heavyweight champion uh, taking on Mark Hunt. And Mark Hunt is a really awesome fighter. But I don't know. I honestly don't know how this one's going to go. Uh, Brock Lesnar, if he can utilize his wrestling, if he can stay away from Mark Hunt's fucking brutal sledgehammer of hands he should win but i'm gonna go with it's so so hard not to go with mark hunt but i am gonna go with brock lesnar um how i don't know brock lesnar needs to find a way to win this fight he needs to find a way to stay away from mark hunt which is very hard with mark hunt i've noticed a lot of people can't do it And he needs to take more cut down, which is no easy task by itself. And um, I could, I mean, Mark Hunt's got such a strong chin too, though. So I don't know. It's stupid to pick uh, against Mark Hunt, but I am. I'm doing it. I swear to God, I am. Um, And that's kind of it for UFC 200, guys. Like I said, I am a little bit disappointed that this has has happened. But what the hell are you going to do? Man. I don't know, guys. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit disappointed, but hopefully we can get another another um, fighter in there. Okay, so Dana White actually just tweeted out, guys. Cormier will fight this weekend, so I'm stoked about that uh, live reaction there. So Cormier is gonna fight. Who he's gonna fight? Uh, I don't know. It, it, it probably is going to be Gegard Mousasi if I had to guess. Ah, um, oh man. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I honestly... I, I want it to be somebody else, but um, we'll see. Uh, so, see you guys next time.